Monday was the first day of free agency, and it was certainly a transformative day for the New York Giants. Ed Valentine of Big Blue View here, along with Tony Del Genio, to uh, to discuss all of the goings on, the uh, the additions of of Brian Burns and a couple of offensive linemen, and the uh, the subtractions of stars Saquon Barkley and Xavier McKinney from the uh, from the Giants roster. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and subscribe wherever you listen to. Uh, to podcasts across the big blue view radio network tony tony how are you i'm reeling in a good my, way. my my head is spinning yeah you know it's 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 funny i used the word when i opened up i used the word transformative and basically i had written that over the weekend in the sort of free agency primer preview that i did that this felt like it could be a transformative free agency period, transformative off season, you know, for, for Joe Shane and the giants. And, and that is certainly what today feels like. This is a much different giants football team than we woke up to on Monday morning. Yeah. And it's not just a different giants team in terms of new players in and, and old players out but it's a change in the philosophy of roster construction. I think that, that Joe Shane, I'm sure wanted to do when he first came in, but, but today you can see him fully embracing that. Absolutely. I, I, I think you're right. And, and we'll get into that as we, uh, as we go along here, but first, Tony, I need to say this. I need to, uh, to kind of get up on my high horse here a little bit and I'm going to kind of chastise some Giants fans here since the Saquon Barkley news broke Monday afternoon obviously Giants fans there's a, a segment of Giants fans that are unhappy there's a segment of Giants fans that are sad there's a segment of Giants fans that are upset especially since Barkley signed with the NFC East rival, the, the much-hated Philadelphia Eagles. But I'm sorry. The, the minority of people out there who are spewing all sorts of vile vitriol and hatred towards Saquon Barkley and, and, and ripping at his character you know, for going to the arch-rival Eagles, I'm sorry. That's just nonsense. The only what what I need to say about that is, look, each and every one of us would try to improve our lot in life. Each and every one of us, if we had an opportunity to go to a competitor that would pay us more money, put us in a better situation and give us a chance to accomplish things we hadn't yet in our professional careers, each and every one of us would do that. And that is what Saquon Barkley did today. And he doesn't deserve to be vilified for it. He did what was right for him. The Giants did what was right for them. And we move on. Yep. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, you can you can fault him or him in addition to Joe Shane for not coming to an agreement last year. Uh, when they had the chance to to do so, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to think that was as much a function of, of the people he hired as his agents at that time. Uh, you know, but this year he wasn't getting an offer anywhere near what the Eagles offered to him. So why wouldn't he take an offer like that? I mean, that, you know, by, by today's standards for running backs, what they gave him, which is, uh, what, approximately 12 and a half million a year. Um, you know, you're not going to find offers much better than that, I think, unless you're Christian McCaffrey. And uh, I don't even know if Christian McCaffrey signs another contract, whether he gets anything near what he what he did this time. So how can you blame him for number one, moving and number two, moving for the first time in his career to a team that has an offensive line that's going to open up holes for him? Absolutely. And I can't blame the New York Giants. I can't blame Joe Shane. No for not wanting to go to that number that's that's an extraordinary number for barkley 
That's more than the Giants were willing to give him a year ago. That gives him an opportunity if he meets the incentives in that deal, because that deal can reach more than $46 million. That gives him an opportunity to earn more than Jonathan Taylor on the three-year $42 million deal he signed with the Colts. That's that's in this running back market, that is a fantastic contract for Saquon Barkley and, and good for him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and right, I think no other running back today got anywhere close to that amount. Am I right? That the Josh highest- Jacobs got Josh Jacobs got four and 48. So Josh Jacobs. Oh, he did get four and 48. So okay. Josh Jacobs did roughly about as well mm-hmm. with, you know, with uh, with a fourth year added. Mm-hmm. To his and deal. that's so, running back that's younger with less wear and tear. Yes. So Barkley Barkley made out about as well as he could have. But Tony, I want to get back to the point about this being transformative for the Giants and this being Joe Shane's opportunity, as you said, to not necessarily rebuild this franchise because that's not really what the Giants are doing, but he reset this franchise to this sort of spending priorities and this sort of position value path that we know he has wanted to since day one, but he didn't have the ability to do that in his first year, he just didn't have the resources you know, financially to, to do that. Last year, coming off a playoff berth, he couldn't necessarily make all of the moves he might have wanted to make because it's, we've talked about the Minnesota model. You, you know, I've, I've asked you to write about it a couple times now, and you've done a great job doing, doing that on both occasions. But when you, when you win your first playoff game in a decade, and you have an impatient owner, it's very, very difficult to walk in and say, we're going to completely sort of just, we're, we're going to take this thing and start over again. But this was a great opportunity with the McKinney, with Xavier McKinney's contract and with, with Saquon Barkley, great opportunity for Joe Sheen to look at this roster move away from paying or overpaying positions that he doesn't value as much and to reset this roster built around the priorities that he and Brian Dable want it to be built around. And it's, and it's not just his priorities on position, his priorities about positional value these days are really in line with what a lot of the NFL has been saying for the for the last years right you you uh you know you build the offensive and defensive lines which people have been dying for the giants to do for years you uh uh you know you don't pay safeties you don't pay running backs and because those are just not as as high value both mckinney and barkley are really good players and they're going to be missed by the giants but paying third dollars a year let's say to have the two of them on your roster is just not something that's that's good business in today's nfl unfortunately absolutely and you know let's let's talk briefly about xavier mckinney mckinney got a four-year 68 million dollar deal 17 million dollars a year he got basically exactly what the uh, the reports had said he was looking for in free agency. I think he's now the fourth highest paid safety, and you know in football. And as you said, Joe Shane simply wasn't going to go there. I talked to Ryan Dunleavy of the of the Post the other day, and and you know on on the show here, and and Ryan made the point that in his experience, general managers we talk about positional value. General managers who don't pay running backs also don't pay safeties. And we saw that come to fruition. It's hard for the Giants to let go a 24-year-old player as good as McKinney. But let's see how they fill that role. And, you know, and let's and obviously 
with some of the moves that have been made other than, you know, the guys that have been let go. We haven't even gotten to those yet. Obviously we see the priorities of where, of where Joe Shane wants to spend his money, but McKinney will be missed. But as you said, it's simply Joe was never going to pay a safety, you know, top five safety money. Yeah. And I was, I was actually shocked at the amount of money that McKinney got. Of course, I mean, the, the thing in this whole business of free agents is that all it takes is one team, right? Uh, you don't need to, you don't need to have the, the, the bulk of opinion uh, on your side. You need to find one team that'll, that'll give you the offer that you want. And and he found it. Uh, but the reason I was so surprised about it is that there are a lot of pretty decent safeties on the free agent market this year. And and I thought that that was really going to depress the market for that position and that he'd come nowhere close to getting 17 million. But obviously I was, I was wrong about that. But the, the flip side of that is if the giants have any free agency money left when they're finished uh, with all of their wheeling and dealing, you know, they might find a good veteran uh, safety in free agency for a number under $10 million a year or something like that. I mean, and if not naturally, they can always try to address that in the draft, but, but there are options for them even having lost the kidding. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I had said this the other day as well. You look at a player's value or whatever, the, the player's value is whatever the market says that it is. And and when it comes right down to it, maybe the Philadelphia Eagles were the only team that was going to pay Saquon Barkley anything close to what they paid him. Maybe the Green Bay Packers were the only team that was going to pay Xavier McKinney the kind of money that that he got but they did and the giants were never going to go there so we move on and the and the other thing right in all of this and you you know you think about the two teams that did spend those big bucks on what we've just been discussing as not the highest value positions on a football team both of the teams we're talking about there are teams that are in win now mode. I mean, the Eagles have been in win now mode for for a couple of years after they got so close the previous uh, season. So you know that that every year Howie Roseman is trying to get them back to the Super Bowl and win this time. And Green Bay, you know, out of nowhere, all of a sudden is a contender, and I think they see their window having opened. Uh, with Jordan Love and a couple of their other young players, and so they're deciding to go for it now too. Those are the teams that that you'll find that'll that will pay up on those things. The, the Giants absolutely. are not in that Super Bowl window, right? Yet. Absolutely. When as when you're the Giants, you look at Saquon as a 27 year old running back who's had a lot of injuries, who's a depreciating asset, who's still a good player. But probably, but obviously not worth, you know, going to the top of the market to uh, to keep him. Which so, uh, as I said, we we move on, and uh, we will see, you know, what sort of team the Giants field here in twenty twenty four. Well, you know, it's uh, so so the defensive line is uh, not looking bad right now, uh, and uh, you know, naturally they get they they gave up. Uh, some important assets in order to to get Brian Burns, and they're paying him a bunch of money. They're, they're talk about talk about paying a lot of money. Uh, you could argue that it was a slight overpay to to give him that that thirty million dollar a year contract. On the other hand, edge defender is one of those positions where you do want to pay for for quality. And Burns is young; they've now got him on a five year year contract, and so like a lot of these things, in a couple of years, it's probably not going to look so bad uh, as long as he he plays well for them but uh, uh, one of the one of the interesting you know tweets i read is and think about this the giants uh traded lennon leonard williams to seattle for a second and a fifth and so what they did today it wasn't it wasn't the, the same picks but they wound up sending a second and a fifth to carolina to get Brian Burns. So that's like, so in some sense, that's about a, a swap, approximately a swap of Leonard Williams for Brian Burns. And if you've cast the, the situation that way, I'd say, well, that's a pretty good trade. Tony, I would say that you're, you're on target there when you talk about, you know, Brian Burns and Leonard Williams, and let's talk more about Burns. I would say, I mean, if, if you want to call it a straight-up swap of, you know, Leonard Williams for Brian Burns, 
the Giants get the better end of that deal simply because Burns is, I think, five years younger. Um, you know, for me, for me, yeah, the second and the fifth, it's, you know, the, the reports had been that the, uh, that the Panthers wanted a first round pick or the equivalent of a first round pick. I'm not sure a two and a five is equivalent to, to a number one, but, Two and a five and the amount of money that the Giants gave Brian Burns. And I'll be honest, with the salary cap exploding the way that it has, it's not my money. It's John Mara's money. I look at the fact that the Giants absolutely needed an edge rusher. They absolutely needed that impact player. I've said it over and over and over. The New York Giants need more impact players, especially in that front seven. And they and they got one on Monday. They got a young one. They got one that they'll have now for the next four or five years in the prime years of his career. Yeah. And, you know, this was for me, this is this is a great trade for the Giants. It's uh absolutely you know, and we go back to using the resources the way that that Joe Shane wants to use it, prioritizing the positions he wants to prioritize. Joe said a few weeks ago that that edge rushers were going to be more important in Shane Bowen's defense than they were in Wink Martindale's defense. So, which when you think about it, makes it kind of interesting that Joe Shane's first draft pick was Kayvon Thibodeau, but but that's that's a whole different that's a whole different discussion but yeah. but for me outstanding move to uh, to acquire Brian Burns yeah and just to add a couple of other you know, pieces of information to to that um the uh it, it was more than just a second and a fifth it was actually so it was it was a second this year and unfortunately it was the number 39 second round pick rather than the number 47 pick so that that part's not so great but it's a but the fifth round pick is in 2025 and then in addition to that there's a swap of fifth round picks this year so that's what the total amounts to this year um uh and and so uh you know it's the only i say the only bad thing about it is having to give up that number 39 pick because uh well, obviously, I would say obviously now they're not going to be going edge rusher in round one or round two of the draft, given given their needs, I think, on the offensive side of the ball. I think they have to think that that Brian Burns, I don't want to say solves the problem on defense because they could still they could still stand to add yet another, I would say, edge rusher. They could they're going to need to get a safety from somewhere. They might want to get a cornerback also. But but I would say the single biggest need, as you say, you know, you, the thing you want on defense is a pass rush. And that's something that they have not have and it's had in its co uh, cost them. And so I think they've accomplished the single biggest thing on defense that they needed to accomplish in in free agency. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it's it's a great move in principle. Obviously, you have to wait and see how it how it pans out, but Brian Burns is a quality, quality pass rusher. And he was somebody that, that I think when he was uh, uh, a draftee, a lot of people on the giants were looking to, to for the giants to select Brian Burns. I thought uh, back in 2019, when Burns was selected 16th overall, the giants missed Burns by one pick. And at that time, a little birdie had kind of whispered in my ear that if he was there, Brian Burns was the Giants guy at 17 in the uh, in the NFL draft. And uh, the thing of it is, that actually worked out okay for the Giants because the consolation <laughs> prize was a big guy named Dexter Lawrence. So, so they wound up getting so, both. <laughs> so, so that's not so bad as a, as a big old consolation no. prize. No. And now no. they've got both guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So there, um, no, you, you definitely can't. And before we talk about some of the additions on the offensive side, Tony, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned giving up the, the second round pick. And I'm glad you brought that up because before we came on the air, I was getting set up here to do all this stuff. And I hadn't seen 
the exact updates on the compensation. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to have to update the big blue view story on that here when we're done. But the thing that, that I think about is all of the chatter that's been out there in the, uh, in the universe about the giants potentially trading up to get a quarterback in this upcoming draft. And I wonder if, giving up that second round pick and now only having the one second round pick. I wonder if that complicates the idea of the giants potentially trading up in the draft to get a quarterback. We could be because the, the, the price generally has been looked at as three second round picks to move up, say from six to three, that was the price in I think it was 2018 when the Jets moved up with the Colts. It might be more than that now. Until this Burns trade was made, the Giants had those three picks, two this year and one next year. They don't have that anymore. So it complicates the idea of making that trade. We might be looking at a scenario where the Giants sit at six, where they sit at six, and see if one of the quarterbacks that they really like, and I, you know, I don't know this for sure, but I think JJ McCarthy's one of them. Um, is if one of the quarterbacks they really like is there at six, you know, then, you know, then perhaps you you make the move for a quarterback in the in the first round of the draft. But I think I think it it's sort of a. It's a side effect of the trade, but I think it complicates the idea of the Giants moving up. Yeah, and you know what? What of course none of us know is what the Giants' brain trust thinks of all the quarterbacks in in the draft, not just the top few that most of the attention has been uh, placed on, but the but the group kind of after that, right? Uh, and you know, it used to be that there was sort of a group of three and then three, right? With uh, with Williams, May, and and Daniels in some order, and then McCarthy, uh, Nix, and Penix, right? Well, now McCarthy seems to have moved up to the edge of that first group. And as you say, you know, he might be there when the Giants pick. He might not be there when the Giants pick. If he's not there when the Giants pick, and assuming that the other three are also gone, then does that other second round pick, number 47, get packaged with some other kinds of draft picks for the Giants to move back into the first round and, and get one of Knicks or Penix? And that depends on do they think that either of those guys can be a franchise quarterback for them, or do they think that those guys are going to be mediocre or backup style quarterbacks or or whatever? So there's going to be a lot of, I think, intrigue between now and uh, – let's say the the second day of the draft <laughs> wondering well, this is exactly what, yeah. what the giant strategy is going to be for that and and this is why as much as we start talking about the draft so early and there's so much curiosity about it and i get it and we do mock drafts and i've been doing them every sunday for a few weeks for a few weeks now excuse me and uh but this is why None of that really matters. None of the mock drafts. And I mean, we can identify needs and all of that, but people get so entrenched in, well, you have to do this, you know, in this pick and you have to do this and you have to do that. None of it matters until free agency comes about because the Giants' needs are different now as we record at 7.30 on Monday night than they were at 7.30 this morning. Their needs are different. Their draft board's going to look different. The resources they enter the draft with are different. It's a whole different universe, and you have to kind of wrap your mind around looking at the draft a different way now. Yeah, and that's just after the first day of free agency. It's not the as first, there, There's more, not, Tony, there's, there's, there, there's more. Uh, I'm already tired, Tony. Come on, really? there's more. We got to do yeah. this again tomorrow and, and, that, and, and wait, free agency doesn't actually technically start until Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday, right. Yeah. This is the legal tampering. <laughs> I'm not you sure. You know, the funny, the funny part about that is 
<laughs> the funny part about that is I was reading a story earlier today about the evolution of the legal tampering period and how the NFL created that. And they they created it thinking that it would that it would eliminate some of the speculation and that it would make Wednesday the actual signing day a much bigger deal. And obviously what it has really done is it's made Wednesday when it's when contracts can actually be signed, it's made Wednesday an afterthought because yeah. all of the big stuff, well, it's most most of the big stuff is already done. And the rest of it will be done tomorrow. And Wednesday yeah. will be an afterthought. So it's just didn't work out the way the NFL thought it would. Yeah, it just had the effect of moving free agency up by two days. Uh, that's fine. You know, I don't, I'm not sure why they had it on, <laughs> on Wednesday in the first place. But, but anyway, I mean, and, and, and there's still a lot of interesting, you know, stuff to go. Obviously, there will be more, I think, free agent signings. Usually once the first week is over, things really die down a lot. But for the first, I think, two or three days of free agency, you still get a lot of activity. Nothing matches, I think, what happens on the first day but but i bet tomorrow and wednesday there'll be interesting things possibly some interesting things that the giants will be doing because they have to find themselves a veteran quarterback they can't go into the season without a veteran quarterback on the roster other other than daniel jones so they've they got to do something about that in in free agency and again we don't know whether they might want to look for a safety in free agency whether they might want to look for a for another cornerback uh in in oh there's more to do there's definitely more to do safety corner i know there was there was uh there was chatter that the giants were meeting with uh darius williams who got released by jacksonville who's a nice player Mm -hmm. jordan poyer who's a good veteran safety who could be a stopgap for a year yeah i think he's maybe 32 now you know a guy that you're not signing long term, but he could fit there for a year. Guy that Joe Shane and Brian Dable are familiar with. They probably need some help at tight end with with Darren Waller sort of waffling on whether he wants to continue to play or not. So there's there's a lot to uh, there's a lot to be done yet. And just as a reminder, folks, we'll be uh, we'll have all that coverage for you at Big Blue View, and we'll be back here on the podcast as well to to keep you guys up to date so please 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 stay with us as we uh as we keep you guys informed tony we are almost 30 minutes in here and we haven't talked about the offensive players who the giants added and we have to talk about first and foremost we have to talk about the offensive line restructuring that Joe Shane did today. I love, love, love what Joe Shane did on the offensive line today. And, and let me let me tell you why. And then you know you then I'll you can you can react to that or or add whatever you want. First of all, John Runyon. They signed now. He's not the top of the line guard. He's not Jonah Jackson. He's not, you know, Robert Hunt. He's not one of those guys that's making, you know, the the top of the line money. But he's a good quality NFL starter. He's a good player. And I think he's entering his fifth season. I think he's only still only 26 years old. So he's in the prime portion of his career. He's not Mark Lewinsky, who's at the end of it, who's at the the tail end of his career. But the other really nice thing about John Runyon is John Runyon has significant starting experience on both sides of the offensive line. So John Runyon gives the Giants options in terms of how they can set up this line. They're not forcing a guy to play the left who's not used to playing the left or forcing a guy to play the right who's not used to playing the right. And, you know, Jermaine Illuminor from the Raiders is a guy we pegged weeks and weeks ago for the Giants as a as a fit because with Carmen Brasillo, who coached him in New England and Las Vegas, guy who can play both tackles, can play guard if he has to, is a starting caliber player, could be a swing tackle, could be a three or four position backup. 
but again, he's a good player, better than anything they had as a as a backup tackle option a year ago, and a guy that gives them flexibility, could play multiple spots for them. And the great thing about both of these contracts is the Giants didn't pay top of the market money for either guy. They didn't overpay for either guy. They got Runyon on three years, thirty million, which is basically the money I think they would have earmarked for Saquon Barkley, and they got Jermaine Illuminor for two years and fourteen million dollars. Which I'm not going to sneeze at fourteen million dollars, but in this market, in this day and age, with this salary cap, with the way money's getting tossed around, that's that's nothing. So they got two quality offensive linemen who can help them at reasonable prices on day one, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, so the, the first thing I'll say is, uh, you know, with, with all the Giants fans complaining today that, that Saquon Barkley is now an Eagle, uh, maybe Giants fans of a certain age will be uncomfortable thinking of the idea of someone named John Runyon being a Giant uh, because uh, John Runyon's father was a, was a long time and really good Eagles offensive tackle who had lots of battles with Michael Strahan back around the, the those are the those, are, those are legendary. <laughs> and I, I remember Strahan <laughs> saying yeah. that, you know, that Runyon was the most difficult player that he went yeah. up against. Yeah, yeah, he was a really good. Unfortunately, John Runyon Jr. isn't as good an offensive lineman as his father was, and he plays guard rather than than tackle. But I agree with you, you know, completely about about the signings. Uh, you know, there, the, the, the Joe Shane was in, uh, I think, a very difficult situation. I mean, he he was in a, he's in a really difficult situation entering this free agency and draft period for two reasons because he has two huge question marks at two of the most important positions on the field. One obviously being quarterback and the other one being at right tackle. And naturally at right tackle, the, the you know, the problem is you don't draft a guy number seven and then give up on him after two years. You have to keep on trying to, to, to make him uh, good and you bring in a new offensive line coach and you hope that that's going to make a difference for him. And so, I'm sure what that what they would love to see is for Evan Neal to work out at right tackle so that they don't they just don't have to worry about that position. But you don't know whether that's going to happen. He could come to training camp and even with Carmen Brasillo working with him, might still look as bad as he looked the first two years. And then they they'll feel they can't go into the regular season with Neal as they're starting right tackle. And so you needed to find someone who could legitimately fill that position if Neil doesn't work out and not wait until you know that it hasn't worked out before you do that. And Illuminor is really sort of the perfect right fit for that because he's kind of good enough to be a starter, but under the ideal circumstances, he's your kind of quality backup. And uh, and he has played guard also, I believe, in, in the past. And so he can be used at guard, uh, you know, as well. And then as far as the Runyon signing goes, Runyon, again, isn't the greatest tackle, but he's a he's a pretty decent pass blocker in particular. Uh, he gives up very few sacks and not that many pressures. And so compared to what they have had at guard these last few years, you know, I would say he's he probably automatically becomes their their best guard since Kevin Zeitler left, and he's not as good yeah. as Kevin Zeitler, but 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 probably the best since Zeitler left. And if if you want to go into the draft, you know, speaking specifically about Runyon, if you want to go into the draft and look for an interior offensive lineman, what Runyon allows you to do, and I I don't know if he's better on one side of the line than the other. I, I'm not sure that it matters which side he plays, but what Runyon's flexibility, at least on paper, allows the Giants to do is to go into the draft and say, whichever, you know, when they when they find the spot where they want to draft an interior offensive lineman, they don't have to worry about, well, he plays left and we need right, or he plays right and we need left. Because whichever one he plays, if they look at him as a competitor as a competitor for a starting spot, 
whichever one he plays, Runyon can play the other one. And as you said, with Illuminor, Illuminor gives the Giants the you know the flexibility to to let Evan Neal fail, and he gives them the backup plan that they didn't have last year if he does fail. And you know, people will say, "Well, what about Tyree Phillips? And what about cutting Tyree Phillips and and, and all of that?" And the Giants never should have cut Tyree Phillips. But Tyree Phillips, I think, has shown us for two years that he's an adequate fill-in. He's he's okay. He can fill in, and he won't embarrass you. But Tyree Phillips, to me, is not a guy you want to roll out there as your week one starting right tackle and say, you know, he's my guy. He's He's the guy you want to bring off the bench you know, for a few weeks for a spot start here and there. He's not a guy you want as your 17-game starter in along the offensive line. Yeah, agreed completely. Uh, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't solve the Giants' offensive line problem. I mean, when you had problems as bad as the Giants had, I mean, you are, you're arguably four of the five positions on the offensive line for the Giants were bad last year. Five out of five when Andrew Thomas was out with his with his hamstring, right? And so, you know, we're all hoping that John Michael Schmitz shows some improvement in year two. Of course, it would help him if he had decent guards on either side of him. I bet uh, that would that would help him to do his job better. Um, and and the other thing that 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 I've been saying for a little while that that people didn't talk about much last year uh, with the terrible play at the beginning of the season. Um, especially with with Andrew Thomas going going down in the first game, those next few games that they played where they where they looked so bad, they were playing all young guys on the offensive line. And I, I'm no expert, but I got to think you need a couple of seasoned veterans in those positions, and you just can't place five young guys out there. That for me, I've said it many times, Tony. There were a lot of questionable sort of head shaking things that were done last year by the giants in terms of building the roster, none more than the offensive line. I mean, as you said, after Andrew Thomas went down, they wound up playing Josh Azudu, a backup guard at left tackle. So they took a guy who couldn't win a guard job, hadn't practiced all, all summer at left tackle and stuck him out there and said, here, protect the blind side. And because Mark Lewinsky had a bad game in week one, they put Marcus McKethan in the starting lineup. And Marcus McKethan missed all of his rookie year with a knee injury, missed half of training camp with a knee injury. And the sum total of his professional experience when he started in week two, the sum total of Marcus McKethan's NFL experience was 20 snaps in one preseason game. He was not anywhere close to being ready. And when I talked to him about it at the end of the season, you know, Marcus admitted that to me. He said, he said the game was going really, really fast and I could hear every crowd noise and I could, and I could see everything that was going on and, and I couldn't focus on what I was supposed to do because he wasn't ready to be out there. And, and that's, and that's what was trying to protect Daniel Jones. Yeah. And I think that that's what having, uh, Runyon in particular is is going to help with. You'll have another guy who's a veteran. I mean, he's and he's still relatively young, right? I mean, he he only came out of Michigan, right. I think, in uh, 2020. Uh, so so he's still a relatively young guy, but you know, five years, four or five years in, uh, four years into his into his career, he's a, he's a veteran the way Andrew Thomas is. So at least now they've got that, and then you've got a Luminor who you know might wind up starting at one of the guard positions, even if Evan Neal uh, does uh, yeah, that uh, wind up playing that, well at right tackle. That depends on, yeah. you know, J Justin Pugh's a free agent. Ben Bredesen's yeah. a free agent. I can't imagine both of those guys coming back. One, maybe. Um, to be honest with you, I hope Justin Pugh's not listening to me <laughs> right now because I, I, I like Justin. I've had Justin on the podcast. I've talked to Justin in the locker room a few times. But if it's me as a backup guy, I think I'm signing Bredesen because he's got he can play both guard spots. He can yeah. play center. 
He's a lot younger. I think I would, and he and he's probably healthier. I think I would go with Bredesen, but it, it, if you don't get a starting caliber guard in the draft, you you can use a Luminor there. It may not be the perfect solution. It may not be what you really want to do, but but you can. So you know, so I like those two moves today. And Tony, Devin Singletary. We haven't talked about Singletary yet. For me, um, Singletary, when you looked at the market, you looked at the guys that were out there, it made so much sense for the Giants to turn to Devin Singletary when Barkley signed in Philly because Singletary's a guy that was drafted in Buffalo when Joe Shane was assistant GM, when Brian Dable was offensive coordinator. Brian Dable knows Devin Singletary's skill set. He's a good running back. He he's a good pass catcher. He may not be a guy that you want to give 350 touches to, like like the Giants did so many years with Saquon Barkley, but you can give him 225 touches, 250 touches as the lead back in a committee, and he's going to get you 800 yards rushing. He's going to get you a couple hundred receiving yards. He's a good player at a much lower cost than than what Saquon Barkley would have cost you. He's not Barkley. I get that. He's not Barkley, but he's a good player. So that move to me when I saw the Giants make that, it just made a ton of sense. Yeah. But that does, you know, raise an interesting question for for the Giants. I mean, I think you know clearly the message that that they they sent by signing him and and letting Barkley uh, walk, right? Is that the running game is not at least at this point? I guess we don't we still don't know what they're going to do in the draft, but at this point you have to think, and especially based on on the offense that that Brian Dable came from in Buffalo and what they did, that the Giants are going to de-emphasize the running game somewhat, which is really what Buffalo decided to do once Josh Allen came into his own. They had they had Devin Singletary and they had they had other running backs as well, but they did not run the ball all that much once Josh Allen got going. In his first couple of years they ran the ball a lot because because they they couldn't rely on the passing game uh to work for them. But but once Josh Allen came into his own they really de-emphasized the running game, uh, sort of, sort of the way the Eagles uh, have done in in the last few years. And so, you know, to me, the signing of Singletary, you know, says that that's what they're aiming to do with the Giants as well. But of course, in order to do that, you need to have the quarterback and the receivers and the offensive line to give you the pass prote- uh, protection to actually have a passing game that can carry your offense. And so. Today's moves on the offensive line and with Singletary are the beginning of that story, but the biggest parts of that story have yet to be written. And I think that those first two picks in the draft, I mean, I'd be very surprised if the Giants sign any kind of big name wide receiver uh, or, or if they sign someone that they really intend to be their starting quarterback in free agency. So I think all of the action on the offensive side of the ball, on the skill side of the ball, is going to happen in the, on those first two uh, rounds of the draft. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they fill out the quarterback and wide receiver position. Absolutely. And I think I said this going all the way back to training camp, all the way back to last summer. And the actions that the Giants took today in in not – you know, trying to match an offer from the Eagles and all of that and, and you know, going with Singletary and spending, you know, modest money on the offensive line and all of that sort of lend to this opinion. But it was apparent to me a year ago, maybe farther back than that, that Joe Shane and Brian Dable didn't want to be a running back centric football team. They didn't want to be a running back centric offense. I don't think, to be honest with you, I don't think there's a chance that Joe Shane ever would have drafted Saquon Barkley in the situation that Dave Gettleman did. 
they came from a place that didn't operate that way in Buffalo. You're absolutely right. And they want to be a quarterback centric football team. They want to be an offense that operates largely the way that many of the better offenses in the league right now operate, where, where you pass, you pass to get ahead and then you run to run out the clock. You know, you run to shorten the game. And, you know, and I think that, you know, letting Saquon Barkley go is part of that. Spending less money on running back is part of that. And we'll, we'll just have to see, uh, we'll have to see how it works out because I know there are still Daniel Jones supporters out there and, and I like Daniel Jones, and I I think that Daniel Jones hasn't always had a fair shake in New York, and and I think 2022 when he when he helped the Giants reach the playoffs is probably the kind of quarterback Daniel Jones really is, given circumstances around him that are functional. But he's, but I don't think he's the guy that that you really want to sort of put everything on his shoulders. And I think the Giants are still looking for that guy. And I think we I think we know just from all the chatter that we've heard that they're looking for that guy. Yeah. And the NFL is is telling you in the in the teams that wind up going far in the playoffs that you have to have an effective passing game. Um you know the 49ers are a team that run that that relies on the run a lot but they have some heck of good <laughs> uh, uh, um, skill play players on the receiving end too in IU mm-hmm. and Debo Samuel and George Kittle and so it's not like uh, they're a they're a run only team i'd say the closest thing to a to a, a run first team among the the better teams in the NFL is the Baltimore Ravens Right. And even they have been trying to to up their passing game. Uh, they uh, they drafted flowers the first round uh, last year. But you saw what happened to them when they played Kansas City. Kansas City uh, played played all out to stop the run. And they basically dared Lamar Jackson to beat them through the air. And Baltimore's passing game isn't yet at the elite level that can beat a defense like Kansas City's through the air and so and that's why baltimore lost that game and so that's the thing you're going to face if you aspire to be among the elite teams in the league you've got to have a passing game that that can be explosive and can at least play decent against against the elite defenses and you know unfortunately there are very few quarterbacks that are up to the task uh the situation with daniel jones has always been what is his ceiling and uh unfortunately we went into the 2023 season saying well his ceiling is at least what we just saw out of him in 2022 and now maybe with better players around him uh maybe his ceiling will be somewhat higher than that and we'll convince ourselves that he actually could be the quarterback of a super bowl team but they got to answer that question. And so now whatever they think of Daniel Jones and what, what we think of Daniel Jones, you know, what, what we think of Daniel Jones plus three bucks will get you a ride on the subway, as they say. Right. <laughs> and so it's what, right. It's what they think of Daniel Jones that that matters and whatever they think of him, the, the very least you can say about Daniel Jones is the guy's had two neck injuries and is coming off an ACL. And so there is no way you go into the 2024 season without having answers at quarterback on on the roster and so i mean I, to me to me clearly they've got they've got two moves at quarterback yet to come absolutely in the next absolutely. in the next two months one in free agency and and one near the top of the draft whether that be doing something in the first round waiting till the second round trading back into the first round with their other second round pick the way that uh, the Ravens did years ago to get Lamar Jackson. I mean, and any number of things, but they've got to make two moves at quarterback because until they develop that elite passing game, they're going nowhere as a, as a playoff team. You know, they showed you can get to the divisional round, maybe in a lucky year, you can get to the champion, the, the conference championship game, but you're not getting to a Super Bowl without an elite passing game. Absolutely. And uh, Tony, in day two of free agency on Tuesday, I think 
I think we can agree that, that the Giants have done their major work of free agency already. The biggest moves that they're going to make have been made, but still a lot to do as they build this roster. Quarterback, tight end, defensive line, you know, some depth perhaps next to Dexter Lawrence, whether that's bringing back A. Sean Robinson or signing someone else cornerback as we've talked about safety as we've talked about so still a lot to be done and i i think we've seen that joe shane will he'll target the places he really wants to spend money which he did with brian burns and he will go out and find modest you know players that will take by today's nfl standards modest contracts he won't shop at the top of the market. I'm not sure he can shop at the top of the top of the market anymore, but I think you're going to be looking at a series of of smaller moves by the Giants. Necessary and important ones, but smaller ones in the in the days to come. So I was trying to remember, and I'm not sure I I my I could be wrong. Did did the Giants sign Bobby Okereke on day one? I believe so. I would have to go back and look I, I, to be honest. I can't with remember you. whether they whether they they did or not. But yeah, but I think you're you're right though that that the that the majority of the big moves have happened and now it's the kind of small to mid size uh moves, the things in the kind of five to ten million dollars a year range that they'll be trying to do to to fill out the roster and decrease the number of, of absolute needs as they go into the draft. One thing I will say before we wrap it up. We've talked about the, all the moves that were made today. This is now Joe Shane's football team, period. This is now Joe Shane's build, Joe Shane's creation. Yes, they still have Daniel Jones, but you know we know, at least if you, if you buy all the chatter, they're trying to find a long-term, a long-term you know, replacement they're trying to find a successor for Jones, but we've talked for a couple of years about Shane being handicapped initially by Gettleman's roster and by the salary cap mess that he was handed. And still last year, he had a lot of Gettleman players and a lot of Gettleman, you know, leftover issues to work through. This is now Joe Shane's roster, Joe Shane's vision, Joe Shane's build. And whatever happens, good or bad, Joe Shane and Brian Dable have to answer for it. Yeah, and the other thing I have to think, you know, is that is that I think the the uh, the, the conspiracy theories among Giants fans, uh, uh, you always you know you, you always hear about about you know, John Mara pulling the pulling the strings uh, right behind behind the scenes making joe shane do this or that but i think if john mara were were pulling all the strings i don't think they would have let barkley walk i think they would have probably found a way to to bring him back and so i think i think you know seeing seeing what he's been willing to do letting mckinney go let barkley go i you know i think that to me anyway that that suggests that you know, john mara is standing back and and letting joe shane do his job yeah what i've said about that tony is this i think John Mara knows. I think John was stung a couple years back by all of the criticism that that he and his family were too involved in the day-to-day -day operation and making the decisions and all of that. I think jo John knows that he hired Joe Shane and Brian Dayball for a reason. He said, you know, when he when they were first hired, he wants them to make the decision about Daniel Jones. He wants them to make that judgment. He has stood back. He, Like you said, he allowed Saquon to walk. He'll allow them to make whatever decision they think is right about quarterback here in the end, I think. But what I've said over and over is when it comes to making these big decisions, when it comes to letting go a guy like Saquon, when it comes to moving on from Daniel Jones, they better get it right. They better get it right. Because if Saquon Barkley goes and wins a Super Bowl with the Eagles and the Giants can't run the football, John's going to remember that. <laughs> and if they if if they if they 
push Daniel Jones out the door and Daniel Jones goes somewhere else and becomes a better player than he ever was with the Giants, John's going to remember that. And, and that will wind up costing Joe Shane his job. But that's why I said this is now this is now Joe Shane's team. It's not, oh, he's still dealing with this Gettleman problem or that Gettleman problem or or this Joe Judge problem or whatever. This is now his team, his build, his vision. And we'll see where it goes. All right, Giants fans, thank you as always for listening. Tony and I went went on and on and on for a while today. Tony, we talked for almost an hour. That was pretty Good interesting. Day. Yeah, it was. It was. All right. It Giants didn't fans. work that way at noontime, right? <laughs> no. You know, at 2.30 this afternoon, people were like, Joe, are you awake? Joe, wake up. Wake up, Joe. You know? See, but, that's what a good nap turned, will do for you. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Tony, thank you for, for the time. Giants fans, thank you as always for listening. Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.